give you a brief intro about myself. Myself, Sahiti Maineni, I did my PhD from UTSPMI, and then uh, I'm now a faculty here. I teach public health informatics courses every fall and spring, and then my research focuses on social media and mobile health technologies, and the way, and ways in which we can enhance user engagement for self-help management using these technologies. Let me give you a, a little bit of uh, background about my training. I'm trained as an electrical engineer, have a master's in EE, and then a PhD in health informatics. And this is the same project I worked on, the social media analytics and mobile health is the project which I worked on for my dissertation as well, in the context of public health and health behavior change. So to start with, this is what I'm going to uh, focus on today. I'll give you a bit of background on what digital health is because everyone's using that as a buzzword, word. digital health, mobile health, digital medicine. What are the differences? What, how is it all related to informatics? And in particular, I'm going to focus on social media <coughs> and mobile health platforms. And I'll give you an overview on the kinds of work we are doing here in these two areas with uh, uh, some real-time projects and the grants that, we're, that we are uh, focusing on. And finally, I'll conclude my talk by connecting how all this work relates to both schools of public health and the School of Biomedical Informatics in the context of consumer and public health informatics. So what is digital health? This is a word that's originally used or that's, that's made famous by this guy called Eric Topol, who authored this book, Creative Destruction of Medicine. And in that, he discusses how healthcare is going to be revolutionized in the next few decades, primarily from a physician-centered perspective to a patient-driven model. How patients are going to take care of their own uh, health data and how are they going to play a role in sharing their data with physicians as their collaborators in improving their self-management self of chronic diseases or health conditions. And that's the definition he actually uses in his book. And uh, recently, AMIA recognized it as the official definition for digital health. So let me read it. Uh, con convergence of digital infrastructure of connectivity, social networking, internet of all things, sensing technology, and health information systems to improve human health. So it's essentially convergence of engineering, informatics, and health sciences. They haven't left out any technological field out there. Everything's covered in this definition. So sense arts to social media to uh, web-based clinical information systems and mobile health. Everything's connected. So it brings in telecommunication sector into, into, uh, into the same umbrella. And that's how we use digital health. And oftentimes, it's interchangeably used with digital medicine. Um, and to give you how the market trend is currently with digital health, this is a graphic I uh, got from Rock Health, which is a an organization that focuses on digital health ventures and uh, uh, fund, obtaining funding for startups in the context of digital health and uh, medicine. And as you can see, in 2014 and 2015, there is a dramatic rise in the way in which uh, digital health ventures were able to obtain startup funding. It is almost $4.5 billion, so just for the startups. And the majority of that chunk goes towards development of consumer wearables, things like Fitbit, Jawbone, in the context of physical activity, and development of personalized wellness platforms that, that may or may not integrate social media technologies. That means they may provide discussion forums or not, or they may integrate themselves with Facebook, Twitter, or not. But the overall idea of this platform is to provide users with a way to monitor their healthier lifestyles. How many glasses of water am I drinking? 
Am I financially sound? Am I reaching my savings? Uh, uh, am I reaching my savings uh, target? Everything, right from health to general uh, life behaviors. And finally, data warehousing and predictive analytics. How can we use all this data that's being generated by consumer variable, uh, wearables, wellness platforms, and clinical data, how can we put all those different kinds of data into, into a single analytics engine and make predictions about how we can better serve patients and how we can better engage them in chronic disease management? That's the focus of, that's the current focus of the market right now. And how are we doing academically? That's the industry and how's research uh, uh, going along in the same field. So uh, recent systematic review on how health technologies are being used in health promotion and behavior change provides us a basic understanding of the kinds of uh, intervention areas we are tackling and the kinds of technologies we are using in, the kind, in health promotion. And this is from 2011 to 2015, so the past five years. Majorly on smoking cessation and healthy lifestyles again, but majority of the work is focusing on smoking cessation. And sexual health promotion, prom uh, promoting contraceptive use or co uh, condom use <coughs> among teens and adolescents. That's another area which being a great focus. And, and uh, drug abuse and ad addiction. How can these technologies that I have mentioned earlier be used to improve or to study substance abuse? And in the mental health research arena, how can we use mobile technologies to understand depression, anxiety, medication adherence? And majority of this work uh, is being conducted actually by Northwestern University, uh, where they have this entire, where they have this this newly formed center called Center for Behavioral Intervention Technologies. And they, they take, you, if you have an idea in mental health, you just walk to them and they uh, take your idea, translate into, it into a real product or into a fundable grant. And they, uh, and th they are the leaders in mental health research right now. So how is it all related to informatics? What's the information problem we are dealing with? Fitbits, they are basically sensor driven, so uh, engineers will be able to develop sensors like that. Wellness platforms, a good designer, a health psychologist, and a behavior scientist will be able to create wellness platforms. But what is the role for informatician in, in this huge field of digital health? It's all about how we are enabling patients or in general health consumers interact with their health information. And all these platforms are allowing us to present that information <coughs> in, a, in a comprehensible manner. And, the, and informatics plays a huge role, the way we visualize, the way we extract meaningful information from all the background data, the way in which we integrate multiple data sources, all that informs the way in which these technologies evolve over time. And the four basic technologies that are being used are mobile health, social media, sensor integration, and serious gaming. These are the four technologies. And as you can see, all these technologies have a way to pro promote or to provide health information to patients or to general health consumers. And we are interested in the ways in which we can improve that provision of information. And of course, I said, uh, how do we integrate data from these multiple sources, from sensors, from wellness platforms, from social media, from clinical data? Can we all put this together and come, uh, come to some meaningful conclusions which can facilitate better patient engagement? And visualization, what's the best way to present that information back to users? Uh, taking into consideration their health literacy levels their edu and their uh, background health knowledge and the stage they are in in obtaining a health-related behavior change or a lifestyle change. So in a nutshell, 
this is how informatics is related to digital health. Informatics enables researchers, in general health researchers, to take data and transform it into a comprehensible format so that we can enable patients to achieve superior engagement and thereby uh, obtain uh, better self-management of their health conditions. That's how informatics is related to digital health. It's just not developing technologies, it's developing better technologies and superior technologies in which information is much more personalized and uh, meaningful without the background noise. And in particular, online social media can provide us a way to turn these technologies into uh, personalized technologies. And how is that possible with online social media or in general uh, online communication platforms? Like you know, any online social media platform <coughs> provides users with a way to communicate with each other, with their peers. And all that communication is digitized, it's in electronic form, in a way in which we can analyze and apply text analysis methods or to even understand human behavior. We can understand human behavior based on user interactions in these platforms. And at the same time, not only do they allow us to understand, but they also provide us with an intervention bed. Once we take the take what they are talking and we come up with uh, ways to improve their communication or improve their health, we can go back to the same environment and develop some interventions and test them out. Or, or those uh, data-driven methods we are coming up with really helping them out to be no, more nuanced or to be more meaningfully communicating in those platforms. And in conjunction with mobile health technologies and all those sensors you have seen in the first few slides, we can get an understanding of behavioral outcomes that are reported on these platforms on an objective level. For instance, I say I ran uh, two miles today. In traditional social media platforms, you need to take my word for granted. But with an integration of Fitbit, if I enable my GPS, you will be able to objectify whether what I said is true, whether the behavior I have reported is true. So the, these technologies which I have shown, all those sensors will let us obtain objective behavioral outcomes in conjunction with the social media platforms. And I'll, that's the background and I'll now move on to the work we are currently doing. I'll not go into too much into too much details about the methods. I'll give you a brief overview so and discuss the implications of the work. But if you have any questions about the methods, the details, please stop me at any point and I can provide you with more details. Let me first introduce you to the data sources we are using in our work. The first one, QuickNet, which is a smoking cessation network, an online social network for smoking cessation. It's been uh, in the market for about 15, 20 years, the longest, the <coughs> longest running network, the largest and the first. And uh, we recently were able to obtain a data set from our collaborator at QuickNet that spans from 2000 until 2015. And the data has about, comprises of about 2.5 million messages that are shared between its users, and there are about 300,000 users. And the second data set, we only have a preliminary version of it. It's called Treatment Diaries. It's a platform that's created for cancer survivors and other chronic disease, people suffering with other chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes to talk about the treatment plans and to understand the ways in which medications can affect their life. And the data we have is more about cancer survivors and we have about 15,000 interactions between users from that particular website. And then we do have a UT Health IRB uh, <coughs> exemption to mine and to mine publicly available social interactions. If there is a website 
health related websites that's publicly available and that's open to and that's open with, without me logging in if i can crawl the data i can do that using the irp so we are we are also actually conducting a bit of research on autism and elderly caregiving through platforms like twitter and facebook and we are using publicly available interactions for that purpose now in our work we majorly use three kinds of methods one qualitative second automated which is which involves text mining machine learning and third finally network analysis method let me talk a bit, bit briefly about qualitative methods grounded theory analysis where we first go look at the data and let the data tell the story to us instead of going in with a theory driven mindset we just look at the data have very broad questions about the data and then we look the data line by line to understand what it is uh, telling us about we try to characterize user communication in these platforms using grounded theory techniques and then we try to validate whatever uh, we have learned using grounded theory techniques using existing behavior change theories and the second and third are very widely established behavior change theories in public health social cognitive theory and trans theoretical model of change and the first one is a taxonomy that has been recently put together by researchers in london where they tried to integrate multiple theories together they integrated about 23 theories into 93 theoretical techniques and put them together and we started using this in recent times so that we have a comprehensive taxonomy in a single place that integrates several different theories together and that with widely tested and established and in addition to behavior change theories we also adopt user engagement <coughs> models there are not many in the context of healthcare uh, the one which has been out there from the past 3 or 4 years is the hims patient engagement framework uh, which has been put together by a group of experts behavior scientists informaticians and technologists and we use that framework to understand how technology can be implemented to support superior user engagement the problem with this framework is it's created with from the perspective of care providers but not from the perspective of consumers so this would work only if we are developing a technology in collaboration with a hospital or a healthcare entity if you are if you are use if you want to develop a technology or if you want to evaluate a technology that's completely user centered and completely user driven we cannot use this engagement framework there are a few others in the business world which they use for consumer engagement but they would only work in healthcare if we integrate them with the behavior change theory so these are this is a very short overview of the kinds of methods we use for conducting qualitative analysis of social media interactions and we do have preliminary results and which we have published uh so this this analysis is from quicknet we conducted grounded theory analysis on quicknet and we are able to identify 15 different themes along the lines of obstacles traditions uh social support and so this is how we group them we, when we first read a message we try to identify these preliminary concepts that you find and we then categorically group them into broader themes <coughs> then we try to understand how those themes relate to all those techniques i've mentioned in the behavior change taxonomy and we thus uh, identify how theories are related to consumer communication in online communities and then we like i said him patient engagement framework we use that quite a bit we try to understand how mobile health applications are being developed Uh, in the context of cancer survivorship spe specifically uh, how whether the mobile applications are indeed facilitating user engagement or in specific patient engagement and what what how are they faring along the board and we found that 
only if we integrate forum-based support or community support, that's when these technologies will be able to provide superior engagement. And there is only one app that's existing right now. Uh, so those are the kinds of results we obtain with using those methods on social media and in, for mobile applications. <laughs> the second kind of methods we use uh, are automated methods because like you see, uh, if we use only qualitative analysis, and I've mentioned how big our data set is, we have about uh, 3 million messages. So it won't be possible, it would, be, it would not be humanely possible to complete the analysis in a given period of time. So it's important for us to scale the analysis which we have conducted using qualitative methods to much larger data sets. However, large scale social media analytics has been done before and all those analysis do not take content of communication into account. They only consider who a person talked to, but not what they talked to the other person. So in this analysis, we try to combine, using these methods, we try to bring semantics into network analysis. And the methods I've used for this purpose are majorly uh, di distributional semantics, where we use large corpus and project it into a high dimensional vector space and try to understand relationship between words and thus try to represent documents which means messages and users into uh, in a large corpus and identify the semantic relationships. And if you look at any social media message, they are usually very short. Uh, they won't provide much background, they won't provide much semantic context. And that's the problem we have faced when we directly applied either distributional semantics methods or machine learning methods. So we have, we have addressed that limitation by introducing outside corpus or outside semantic information and, uh, through external corpus and the results we have obtained are promising. This, is, this table provides you a comparison of how the methods fare. Uh, this is using LSA, latent semantic analysis uh, uh, method within distributional semantics. And we have used multiple machine learning algorithms. We have tested those with and without background information. And these are the F measures uh, we have got. F measures for uh, how well the unannotated messages are categorized into those themes we have identified using qualitative analysis. And right now, SVM is leading with its background corpus, but we are testing out a few other, few other advanced methods like word embeddings and such. And the future of this work is uh, we want to look at how semantics change over time. How, do you, how does user communication evolve over time? Remember, we have a, a data set that spans over 15 years. So we can look at the ways in which user communication may be related to particular semantic context over the 15 years. And if it relates to behavior change or certain smoking behaviors, uh, that's, that's the future uh, direction for automated methods. And that, most of that work is, is inspired by previous work by McArthur and uh, Brusa. And the third kind of method we use is mostly network analysis. We do network modeling, network visualization, and network description. We try to understand whether being connected to another user actually influences our health behavior, or whether talking to another user about a particular kind of topic influences a final behavior. Uh, and, uh, and the particular methods we use for this purpose are affiliation exposure model and exponential random graph models. They are very as well established in the fields of behavior change and public health. They have been used to understand smoking cessation, to understand drug abuse, but are were never applied in the context of social media or inclusion of semantics into network analysis. And this is how the results would look like. I don't think it's very clear. 
So this is a network of Twitnet users. The color of a dot indicates whether they are a smoker, a current smoker, an ex-smoker, or a relapser, and the way in which they grouped by means of semantics. So this middle group are all talking about motivation, how to stay quit, what inspires them, and things like that. The bottommost cluster, they are talking about traditions. So Quitnet has a, a group of has a set of traditions they have developed within themselves. So they have every week bonfires uh, where they keep tab off their unsmoked cigarettes and donate them to bonfire virtually. And they have a way of giving virtual rewards like a pet, if you stay quit, for, if a user stays quit for 30 days, they get a virtual pet. If they stay quit for about three days, they get a bracelet. All, all virtual, so uh, we can see how users cluster among themselves when talking about certain types of content. And this is all about social support. Whenever a user relapses, they usually come back to the group and say, uh, I, I, I let down my family, I'm so sorry, uh, tears rolling down my eyes, you know, things like that. And at that time, the other users provide emotional support to them. So they are all grouped under that theme called social support. So we try to understand how users, in relation with the kinds of messages they post, come together as a group. And we try to establish their relation with a particular smoking behavior. And recently, we have started looking at network structures and their differences. For instance, this is a group of users um, who, are, who have all successfully quit and are still not smoking, <coughs> and how they communicate about this particular topic called traditions. And this is a group of users who quit, who actually relapsed. So they used to be non-smokers, and they, they used to be, they are currently smokers, but they tried to quit and they failed. So how do they d discuss about this topic, traditions. What are the network topologies? Do they have a hub? Is there a central figure within the network? You're trying to understand if a network position plays a role uh, when in, in specific content types. And you, as you can see, this is the same group of people talking about another topic, which is progress. So these are also relapses, like people in this group. But these people are talking about traditions, and these people are talking about progress. So uh, trying to understand the differences in network topologies, the ways in which people connect, the structure of relationship, when taking content into consideration, is the essence of this particular uh, work. So that's it. And finally, what do all these methods mean? What do, what do we get out from these methods? What's the take home point? Qualitative methods lets us understand how user generated content is driven by theories or how it facilitates certain theoretical constructs, although not planned, although not pre planned. And we try to identify certain constructs that we found very often in user communication, like social support traditions that implicitly inform human behaviors. Uh, for instance, that bonfire I've mentioned about. When a user donates unsmoked cigarettes to fire, there, there are other users who are also logged in at the same time, and they learn so much from these users who have been successfully been able to participate in the bonfire. Observational learning, sense of progress, sense of establishment. All those are promoted by those implicit community traditions. And we found talking about belief uh, does not help that often. I think it's not, it's not found as prevalently as other themes. Uh, smoking, uh, for instance, I don't believe smoking helps me. It's not a theme we found that often in any of the user-generated posts. That may be because. A user joins networks like this only once they have decided to quit. So that may be a reason why we haven't found belief-related posts in this content. 
And we found for forum-based interactions right now are facilitate superior user, user engagement. And we were also able to relate specific types of content to positive behavioral outcomes using those influence models I have talked about. We found that users talking about progress, family and friends are more likely to stay quit than users who do not. Similarly, we found being friends with certain other users who talk about certain types of contents. For instance, I'm friends with person B who talks about traditions, virtual rewards, or social support. I might be more likely to stay quit than a person who's not talking to the same user who's discussing these types of content. So the kinds of people we need to be affiliated with and the kinds of posts we need to, we need to exchange, both these are able to help us understand the ways in which we can help users in these online communities stay quit. And as you can see, these directly relate to ways in which we trigger user engagement, the way in which we trigger connections to other users or access to content. And I'm going to dis describe to you how we are doing it. And of course, there are limitations to these methods. Generalizability. All this work has been done in the context of smoking cessation. Can we apply these to other behaviors or to other chronic conditions? We are in the process of doing that. We are going to extend the methods to another platform, like I said, treatment diaries in the context of cancer survivorship. So we are trying to validate what we, we are trying to establish uh, generalizability across behaviors and across chronic conditions. And the classifiers we have used, we have used SVM, but we can use advanced classifiers to improve accuracy of our automated methods. So we are planning to use uh, word embeddings. And like I said, we use TASA as our external corpus to improve the uh, accuracy of our methods. And we might use other corpus to t test how the methods fare. And all the analysis we have done so far is cross-sectional in nature. We haven't looked at evolutions over time. So development of methods that address longitudinal network modeling and the ways in which users change over time, uh, all that is required. And finally, we are only able to get to correlation. We haven't actually established influence yet. So does talking about a certain type of content influence someone or it just correlates to someone uh, or it just correlates to being quit? That's a difference we need to address. Uh, moving from correlation to influence is very critical to advance these methods further. So that's the methods part of it. And yes. So how are you going to do that? So we are using something called uh, exponential random graph models, uh, which will help us deal, those net deal with those network dependencies and get to uh, influence rather than just correlation. So, what, so those methods, what they actually do is that we will provide the method with an observed network. It will take the network and create all possible statistical formations of, the, of, that, of networks that can form by chance and compares whether the formation of this network is by chance or is it driven by a particular network phenomena like homophily or like by social influence. And then if the probability is higher, we can say that the, the mechanisms which we are seeing in the network are driven by influence or by homophily rather than just correlation. So I guess there are two correlation versus causation mm -hmm. questions. That, this is one. Yeah, this is one. Uh, the second issue is, uh, well, let's uh, pick something like uh, obesity and just talk this word. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the person, uh, the weight of your close contacts determines your weight. So are you, if my wife is overweight, should I divorce her? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about that? So this, uh, the models actually... I lose weight, I mean. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
that actually goes back to that question. If you look at the debates that happened at, around Christakis' paper, they initially they actually question about whether it's influence or it, whether it's homophily, right, right. and so that's, that's what this that's method. That's what yeah, that's what we are addressing here. Uh, so let's say hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> let's say no. Okay. So if we if we think it's influence, then we can we do have ways in which. We can counterbalance yeah, that. <laughs> so maybe instead of providing interventions to you, we provide interventions to that person who influences you. So, so that's what the, that's what's traditionally done in the context of network interventions. Yeah. You can't divorce your wife just for weight loss. Divorce. <laughs> so, so to summarize, these are the limitations of the methods. Uh, but having learned so much from these, from network analysis of uh, QuitNet, we have moved on to development of actual applications. So, this is a wellness plat social platform we are currently developing. We don't have. Uh, name for it yet, but we are collaborating with employee Office of Employee Assistance Programs here at UT Health. Uh, they are interested in taking the platform and providing it to UT Health students, faculty, and employees to help them stay quit. And the content that's being put into this particular platform is all driven by the analysis we have done earlier, the qualitative and network analysis. And these interactions are informed by the engagement models we have been studying. So we are trying to make it a theoretically validated, data-driven, user-engaging platform. And there are, this is just a component of it. There are several other features to it. Uh, so uh, we would have a discussion forum. We would have challenges every week. We would have competitions held things like that using this platform. So we are very excited about this opportunity. We have just been, a, last week is when they have shown interest and we are going to collaborate with them and take it live within UT Health first, yes. How is this going to be different than QuitNet? So QuitNet, uh, I haven't been able to show you a screenshot of it. QuitNet is predominantly a forum-based communication. So all they have is a threaded uh, or nested communication. So it should all be user driven. If a user initiates a communication, that's when uh, any interaction happens in that network. And we are trying to make it content driven. So a moderator would post new kinds of content. And uh, we are trying to make it more, uh, uh, more content. Are you going to have um, moderators? Um, when, so when I say moderator, it, I mean to say we are going to, so this is what we are thinking. We are going to actually ask for some volunteers from within UT Health who have tried to quit and who actually who actually quit successfully. So ex-smokers, and we are going to take their support in building and maintaining the network. So they are, we call them elders. So, <laughs> so within the network, so we are going to take their support to keep the network with engaging. So that's one. And we try to take our work and integrate it with a new, few other methods like ontology development. And we retained patient engagement framework and uh, uh, in the context of cancer survivorship to develop, de to develop much more nuanced uh, consumer-facing platforms. This particular one is called DigiLegos. Uh, I'm currently collaborating with Dr. Sui Tao on this, and she pr and uh, she and I are working towards developing this. But this is the core of this platform, the question corner, where people can post any kind of question in lay terms, and the system should be able to provide back to them an answer in in a comprehensible manner, and that's context sensitive. Uh, so. That's the background of this work.
so we, are, we have moved into a new domain, cancer survivorship, and a new set of methods have been integrated here. Uh, and finally, uh, this is a project we are currently doing with the Harris Hispanic Health Research Center at Brownsville. Uh, so we have a PI who is interested in taking mobile health technologies and uh, promoting uh, User, man, user engagement at a more uh, advanced level, and we are helping out that group to, to, and we are in the process of developing a mobile application to facilitate better collaboration between research group and between research participants. And the way we are doing it, we are trying to use annual questionnaires and, like I said, better ways to disseminate information and discussion forums to keep them engaged, to keep them focused within the research group. Uh, that's another project we are currently working on. And other arenas, like I said, all these platforms are worth, worth so much if uh, it all depends on the truth that people are putting out about their health behaviors in these networks. Because we are tr finally trying to connect user behavior to user participation in these networks. And we can only rely on them for so much of time where they are actually putting in true information about their behaviors. And there are ways to address this limitation. One way is sensor integration. That way we can try to objectify behaviors to some extent, although there are ways to cheat these sensors as well. But uh, this is one way to address the limitation to some extent. So we are in the process of actually uh, developing a mobile app that would integrate this particular sensor that measures levels of carbon monoxide in a person's exhaled air uh, and furnish it as another piece of information on a social media platform. So we are trying to integrate sensor data with social media platform. And that requires personalized app ordering. And uh, this company only does iOS apps. So all they do is provide us with an SDK. And we have to develop our own apps on Android platform. And because we are doing research at large scale in these networks, we can't use just uh, Apple phones or Apple platforms. So we want to do something that's better and much more scalable in a way. And that's why we want to do uh, Android. And hence, we need to order an app for this that's personalized and that's very context sensitive to the platform we are developing. And this is another work that's currently ongoing. This is called Angel Sensor. Not sure if you have heard about it. This is the world's first open source health sensor. You can literally, uh, they just provide you with the hardware, and they provide you with an open source SDK. And you can order an app in whichever way you want. You can furnish the data in any format you want. You can integrate with it with any application. There are no proprietary rules that limit your uh, use of data from this particular sensor. It has been very recently released. Uh, and these are all the behaviors it will be able to track. So uh, we are in the process of putting together our NAP for this as well, uh, where we can integrate this open source sensor with social media platforms to obtain objective accounts of health behaviors. So that's the overview. So uh, all those apps we develop should be driven by those principles I have discussed before, which are behavior change theories, user engagement models, and those lessons we have learned from social media analytics. If we do not, this app will be like any other app that we are seeing today. So that's, that's the important lesson we should <coughs> keep in mind. So how is all this work related to consumer or public health informatics? Like, you, like you've seen, we are taking health information that's posted on online social media platforms and trying to get meaningful patterns out of it, through which we, are, we will be able to personalize health information, develop targeted recommendation engines, and facilitate superior user engagement. And because we are combining multiple sources of data, especially social media interactions and sensor data, we will have a way to create an integrated data warehouse that's entirely driven by consumer data, mm -hmm. and that's not clinical. 
So we can use this data with all the informatics techniques we have. We can mine and use this data to understand and also to facilitate health-related behavior changes. So this is directly related to health promotion and behavior sciences. That's a core subfield within public health. And because we are doing, dealing with user-centered designs and user-facing technologies, that's consumer informatics. So that's all I have. And I would like to thank all these people whom I have collaborated with over years, uh, Nate Cobb and Amy Ohm, who have shared their data with us, CPRIT for funding the initial part of this work, and NIH for, current, for currently funding the work. And uh, Dr. Fujimoto is at School of Public Health, and she's an expert at network analysis models. Dr. Cohen, an expert in distributional semantics here at SPMI. Sweetow for lending her expertise in ontology development. And Hua Su for helping out with mobile health development and uh, background on NLP and corpus management. And thank you. And here are a few selected references I have furnished. Any questions? <laughs> um, because 60% is genetics, uh -huh. and it takes drugs and things like that to, to affect it. So do you know kind of what the limits are? Is there any indication of that? What uh -huh. would count as success, for example? How would you know? Getting people to at least keep track of their behaviors about this. It, it's more about engaging users in their health. It, that's, I, I think that would be the first step we would want to achieve. Meaning, uh, eliciting that interest in managing health data and uh, providing ways for them to be engaged. That's the first step uh, of all this work. And that would ultimately help us understand whether better user, if users are really engaged in their own health, then we will be able to get a better understanding of whether how human behaviors work, how would they transcend across generations or across different it's cultures. From my own personal experience tracking fitness and just occasional encounters and things like that, is that there's not a, unless it's useful, I mean, personally, there's not much motivation. I mean, I can wear a fitness tracker and go sit out. If I get a present in the office, it's not going to go off. A fitness tracker? <laughs> it's just not. It's not there's not enough hours in the day. <laughs> Meaning, I personally bought a Fitbit and returned it two days later because I didn't find much use to it. That's what I'm saying. So the current sensors do not provide that level of engagement that we as consumers want to obtain. Well, I'm just saying that I think there's maybe, you know, health promotion type. Mm -hmm. there's, there's certain factors like the genetic issues mm -hmm. and other system-wide factors that affect the person, right? In the, which ones are modifiable? How modifiable are they? Mm -hmm. Do we have any data? I mean, I would want to know if there's a program that's been effective, what does effective mean? And because, and, you know, say you, you show that you can make a change in 10% of the population, you know, 10% cessation rate. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that good or bad? It's better than zero. It's better than increase. But, It's about 23%. People who have used QuitNet are 23 times more likely to stay abstinent from smoking than people without support. Right, it's watching. Uh, I mean, one would think that if you well, want to quit, you can't quit, didn't quit, you're less likely to. So, we are try the so when we are conducting social media analysis that we are trying to understand those like you are saying what are the modifiable factors to the unmodifiable factors i think that's what we are trying to understand we are at least trying to get a sense of those factors which are 
modifiable in the context of human behavior. Uh, does, yeah, we don't know how, how it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, my wife is very, very thin. <laughs> 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 so, um, social norms, have you looked into that? So, the taxonomy which we are using, it actually looks at social norms. So, we do consider that uh, as part of the analysis. So. So, oh, the so social norms is the basis for the health belief model, and uh, the advanced versions of it all discuss social norms. And uh, I just mentioned taxonomy because it just puts all those theories together, and they classify it based on norms. And they they have these cat sixteen categories of which norms is one. So there is a way of uh, taking norms theoretically and translating them into features within a, so an intervention. So are we saying, are, are we asking the question of uh, do social norms play a role, or are we trying to quantitate the effect of social norms? Both, actually. Okay. Both. So it seems likely that social norms play a role. So, what, so if all my friends are fat, it's not as I'm your bad. Friend, <laughs> <laughs> Now I have one thing. <laughs> but if all my uh, regular contacts are, are fat, it's, uh, it seems clear that being fat is not uh, as bad a thing in my social environment. Now, now yeah. Big is beautiful. Big is beautiful. That's right. That's what I hear. Mm -hmm. You never and told me that before. I feel about it. And that, that happens all the time. You, I think we have observed it. Even in Quitnet, uh, their social norms play a role. But it, it's trying to understand how do we, if there is a social norm that isn't uh, ideal, that's floating around, how do we correct it is the question. Uh, Meaning, you would want to correct it because that you see made me feel a lot better when you said it was beautiful. And you know, smoking is the best way to reduce our health care expenditures in this country. Well, that's not true. <laughs> no, it is. <laughs> well, it's our lot better. Social security, pensions. Just saying, you got to remember. If we decide what we want to change, right? But my point is that uh, we may save years of life, which are expensive. I agree. We want to get rid of those. But uh, but uh, you know, they die very slowly. They're painful. Yeah. What if there's really the two elements? Uh, you can't look at them. It looks like one of them is. The effectiveness of the tools, the, the characteristics of the social networking and things like that, to how to optimize that as an as a intervention. Mm -hmm. But the second thing harkens back to what Dr. Joseph said is, how do we appropriately judge which individuals might be most benefited by mm -hmm. these participations? And, and mm -hmm. I don't know how you, or are you evaluating that or how difficult is that to evaluate? Coming back to addiction, I mean, you can say 12-step program is, quote, one of the better interventions, but not everybody uh, has the okay. characteristics to be successful in a 12-step program. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I would imagine there are individuals who, I don't know if it's introversion, extroversion, and other characteristics, but how do you, how do you evaluate that to help, to help clinicians give these recommendations on what to screen that participation? I think in this work we are looking at it to some extent because when, when we are classifying users, we do it just not by their behavior, but uh, we do have a set of demographic and social characteristics by which uh, we can classify the users. And by looking at them uh, from those perspectives, by modeling networks in those perspectives, we may be able to get to those questions, but we haven't actually pursued them. And, yeah, yeah, exactly, things like that. And we did find one thing that this, these networks work the best for middle-aged females. Uh, 35 to 52. Uh, they are the right, most. 
<laughs> so they are the ones who are really active participants and get the most out of these networks. So they are, they are the contributors and and uh, influencers. Yeah. Pardon? They also have a lot of time. How do you say that? They have a lot of time. <laughs> Why would they have a lot of time? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're competitive. It'll change. So you can identify people that are competitive by looking mm -hmm. at their social networks and their activities. It's all just the first line of Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, all right. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing at UTP. Oh, really? Oh, really? Memorial Hermit apparently has a program. Ah, okay. Oh, that's what you need. Yeah. yeah.